Well, good evening and welcome to our five o'clock service here at St. Matthew's. Uh, my name is Paula Aliff and I'm a member of the leadership team here. So welcome if you're in the building and if you're watching online. So we're continuing our series in Mark's uh, Gospel this evening and we're going to think about some verses from chapter 7. And verses 20 and 21 say this. He, Jesus, went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. That's a stark reminder, isn't it? That we all need to hear in order to test our hearts, to check if we truly love God in the way that we should. And our first song of three reminds us that we need to come to the Father, we need to come to God through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, because great things he has indeed done. So let's please stand and sing to God be the glory.
through even the darkest place we thank you that we can know that and call out to you that you could be our strength and our hope in times of fear so we pray that we would get a greater love for you tonight that we'd get to know you better and place our trust more firmly in you and you alone in your name we pray amen
Please take a seat. Well, it's great to see so many people here this evening, um, and now it's an opportunity for us to, to talk to somebody maybe that we haven't spoken to this evening, um, have a chat. Uh, Frank will bring us together in a few minutes. Maybe talk about something you're thankful for this week. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting your conversations. It's nice to see you chatting. Please do carry on those conversations where you left off. At the end, there'll be some tea and coffee and biscuits. It'd be great if you could stay um, and meet a few people then. If I haven't met you before, my name is Frank. I'm one of the ministers here. Um, and it's great to have you here, especially if you're here for the first time. If you are, um, I would love to say hello to you properly. Um, afterwards, I'll be over by the, the door as you make your way out. Um, just before we pray, I'm going to tell you about things happening at St. Matthew's Church at the moment. As you can see, next Sunday, we, uh, we, we're continuing to look at Mark in our small group Bible studies. But um, at five o'clock, we're going to have a different series for the last four Sundays of the term um, on how people change. I think most Christians realize that when we come to Jesus, the biggest thing that he gives us is forgiveness from God and eternal life. Uh, but that's, a lot of that feels like it's in the future. And how does being a Christian really change our behavior and our, our, and our emotions now? How does it really help us and transform us? We're looking at that over the next four Sundays. Um, and we've got the titles for that. God is great. We don't have to be in control. God is glorious. We don't have to fear others. God is good. We don't have to look elsewhere. God is gracious. We don't have to prove ourselves. You're probably used to us working through Bible passages, one at a time, like through Mark or Isaiah or whatever it is. Um, but just from time to time, we like to sort of step back and say, what does the Bible have to say about a particular theme? And look at different parts of the Bible that speak on, on that issue. Uh, then uh, the other thing to mention that is coming up, it's not a very busy time in church life. We just had our church weekend away, so that was kind of our big thing for a while. But we have got a church lunch coming up um, next month, 17th of March. Even if you don't normally come at that time of day, it's great if people at five o'clock get to meet people 
at 10.30 and mingle and get to know each other. So that would be a good Sunday to come for lunch and then maybe come back again at 5 o'clock later. You can just bring food with you, just anything simple. Uh, don't food you've got to slave away and cook something impressive. Just pop to the shops and pick up something cold and that'll be fine. Uh, and we'll just bring it and share that with each other. Um, and then we'll hear from different church members about some of the causes that they are passionate about. So we have mission partners that you hear a lot about that we pray for regularly, but there are lots of other good things that we do between us um, for, for Jesus, and this is an opportunity for you to tell us about those and uh, for us to hear and, and understand and pray for those things. Good, I'm going to hand over them for, for some prayer now and hand back to Paula for that. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you for your church, communities of your followers, both here at St. Matthew's and throughout the world. Lord, we give you thanks for our brothers and sisters in Christ as we strive to know and love you more deeply. Help us to help each other deepen our joy in Jesus. Help us to help each other carry one another's weaknesses and burdens. Help us to help each other understand your will for our lives. And Lord, help us to point those you place in our lives to the hope that you promise for us. As we live in a world of turmoil, where suffering, hate, Hardship and sadness often feels overwhelming. And we pray this too, Lord, for St. Mary's Wilkinson, as our friends Andy and Amy Thomas also strive to lead that church faithfully. We thank you for the training day that took place yesterday for their children and youth leaders. And we ask that this training would equip their leaders well and enable them to continue to grow in confidence as they serve together. We pray too for their home groups meeting each week. And Lord, we give you thanks that new people have joined and we ask that you would continue to bless them as they study Matthew's gospel. And for Andy, as he preaches from chapters 26 and 27 of that gospel, that the whole congregation would love Jesus, worship him more and more. And Lord God, may that be our desire too, to love and worship Jesus more and more. And so Lord, help us now to listen well to your word. Help us to put to one side the things that dominate our thoughts and our actions. Help us to test our own hearts as we listen to Dominic explain Mark 7 to us. Thank you that you've been with him as he's prepared this week. And we ask that you would help him now as he speaks to us. Lord, in your mercy, we bring our lives to your loving care. Make us more like Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to turn to God's word now. Our first reading is from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 1 to 8, and can be found on page 193 of the Church Bibles, and Inish is going to come and read that to us. So, page 193 of the Church Bibles, um, chapter 14, um, verses 1 to 8. You are the children of the, of the Lord our, your God. Do not cut yourselves or shave the front of your heads for the dead, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possession. Do not eat any detestable thing. These are the animals you may eat. The ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roe deer, the, will, the wild goat, the ibex, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. You may eat any animal that has a divided hoof and that chews the cud. However, 
of those that chew the cud or that have a, diff, a divided hoof, you may not eat the camel, the hare, or the hyrax. Although, although they chew the, the cud, they do not have a divided hoof. They are ceremonially unclean for you. The pig is also unclean. Although it has divided hoof, it does not chew the cud. You are not to eat their meat or touch their carcasses. And our second reading is from Mark chapter 7, which is on page uh, 1010. And we, uh, Henry's going to come and read verses 14 to 23 for us. So that's page uh, 1010. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull? he asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from outside can defile them? For, for it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Hello. I'm Dominic, and I'm one of the occasional preachers at St. Matthew's. Um, it'd be great for you to keep that passage open so you can check that what I'm saying makes sense. Um, and before I start, let's, let's pray. Uh, dear God, uh, please give us the wisdom to understand your word today, to listen to you, and allow your word to change our hearts and minds. Amen. So, I didn't think that when I was younger, I would spend a lot of my life thinking about jewellery. But as a teacher, and especially teaching at a girls' school, you realize very quickly that jewelry is pretty important to pretty much every teenage girl, and that earrings, necklaces, and bracelets are some of the most important things in their lives. Now, in almost all schools, the rules around uniform and jewelry are fixed. So typically, any inappropriate items must be confiscated and handed back later, maybe that day, or maybe even after a week. And those rules exist in schools because of a belief that if students are following the rules on uniform and appearance, that means they'll also follow the rules on learning, about, uh, learning and behavior in lessons. And so I have to spend a fair chunk of my working life asking girls to take off their jewelry. And understandably, they're never that happy about that. So I'll receive a barrage of questions. Why do I have to remove this? Why can't I wear hoop earrings? What is wrong with these rings? It's not hurting or distracting anybody. Good questions. And one of the first things I learned as a teacher is to pick your battles. There are some moments when behavior needs to be dealt with firmly, and other points where you're just fracturing a relationship with a student if you try to force them to follow a rule. Just giving a student endless detentions and punishments will not cause that student to change. You could try and force, punish, force uh, them to follow all the uniform rules and look correct, but it doesn't actually fix the inner problems of that student. Those inner problems are just waiting for the opportunity to explode into an argument or worse. So instead, what I'll do is I'll just ask the student to put away the jewelry, maybe we'll do it quite subtly, and I won't confiscate it. And I might not be following the official rule, but the overall outcome is better, right? The student isn't becoming angry, and they're not becoming annoyed at me, and they're more likely to engage positively with school. Now, there are always teachers in school who follow every uniform rule rigidly, confiscating anything they can find. And I imagine if you cast your mind back right now to your own school, you can probably imagine them right now. And the thing about that is doing this will almost always just annoy and upset the student, right? It makes them more likely to push back, cause disruption. So even though on the surface, 
that student's appearance looks better, rigidly following the rules is not actually fixing the deeper problem underneath. It, in fact, it's actually making it worse. So overly focusing on enforcing the uniform's rules actually can mean that your students look correct, but creates an environment where the students resent and they oppose teachers. So the rule has lost its original purpose of trying to improve behavior. Now, these teachers aren't technically doing anything wrong, but they are creating a problem by overly focusing on rules and restrictions without actually dealing with the problem underneath. And in the passage we just read, we see a similar problem happening. The religious leaders of the Israelites have become entirely focused on following and enforcing the rules because they've created a culture based on the idea that if they follow all the rules about how and what they eat, they'll be perfect and pure. Because what the Pharisees are doing and what these overly strict teachers in school are doing is also a mistake that we can make. We think that our problem is external. Look down with me at verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. So in our passage today, Jesus has just been having a conversation with the Pharisees, the religious leaders and teachers at the time, who were shocked at Jesus' disciples eating without following the rules of doing a special ceremonial washing first. And Jesus has just finished speaking to the Pharisees, pointing out their hypocrisy, and now he calls out to the crowd so that they can listen to him. You can imagine the moment, right? The great teacher, Jesus, is calling everyone together, saying, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. The crowd is probably holding their breath, desperate to hear what Jesus is, say, is going to say. And then he says something a bit surprising. We see in verse 15 that Jesus says, nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. And you can imagine the kind of stunned silence in the crowd. Jesus, this amazing teacher who's been going around healing people, the person that everyone in the area has been going on about how wise he is, how smart, how intelligent, and here he is talking about something coming out of a person. People are probably looking at each other wondering, is he, thinking, is he talking about what happens on the toilet? And it's not just the crowd who are a little confused. We see that in verse 17, after he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. So Jesus leaves this crowd, who are probably you know, scratching their heads, thinking about their toilet, and it's only when they're indoors and in private that the disciples finally come up to Jesus. And you can imagine they're, they're maybe a little bit sheepish. They're looking at each other, being like, who's actually going to go talk to him? Approaching him, and they maybe say something along the lines of, um, Jesus, you're doing a great job. You know, you're a bit of a celebrity now, and it's just a bit weird about talking about the toilet and number twos. You know, it's a bit crass. A bit embarrassing, a bit humiliating, maybe try something different tomorrow. But it's pretty clear that they've got the totally the wrong end of the stick. Let's read verse 18 together. Are you so dull, he asked, don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into the heart, but into the stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Jesus isn't holding back. He calls them dull. Jesus feels like he was being pretty clear, right? He says, don't you see? He's shocked about how slow they're being, that they don't understand what he's saying. Jesus sounds a little bit like I do when I talk to my year sevens about the difference between a simile and a metaphor. They just don't get it. Uh, Jesus is having to explain what he meant, which perhaps shows that, they're, that the crowd and even the disciples are pretty fixed in the culture of these rigid rules. Jesus is challenging the Israelite food rules, which were created by God over a thousand years ago before this, when the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness. Rules about what foods they could and couldn't eat, and how they were to be cooked and eaten, as we read just before this reading in Mark. And God created those rules to demonstrate the difference between the Israelites and the other cultures around them, to show them how they were different. They were special because they were God's people. Now, God gave these rules to the Israelites to help them remind them of the impurity and imperfection of the rest of the world, so that every time the Israelites cooked and ate meals, they were reminded of this. The rules weren't put in place so the Israelites could become pure and holy, but to be a helpful reminder to them of just how impure and broken the world was. But what the religious leaders had done is they'd twist the original purpose of these rules. They took the tradition and instead changed it to mean something very different and to be actually more important than it really was. So the food rules were intended to show how impure the rest of the world was in contrast 
with how incomprehensibly pure and holy God is. And these extremely convoluted rules were to show the vast difference between the Israelites and God. But the religious leaders had taken that symbol of impurity, eating the wrong food, and decided that if they focus really, really, really hard on following those rules of which foods to eat and which foods to not eat, they would become totally pure. So Jesus' explanation in verse 18 and 19 that nothing that enters a person from any outside can defile them because it goes to the stomach shows the disciples that the Pharisees had totally missed the point. These rules weren't created so that they could earn their way to purity by choosing to eat and not eat the right things, but instead they were created to show the Israelites how far from purity they were. They weren't a checklist to how to become pure, but instead to show the Israelites that it was impossible to actually become as pure without God. But what the religious leaders had done over the long time since God had established those rules was to take the original purpose and meaning of the rules away and instead just decide to apply their own ideas to it. And that's something that we can also do today. We can take rules and we can twist them to our own ideas. Uh, some of you may not know this, um, but I didn't have the easiest time passing my driving test. Um, I began learning in the summer of 2017 as a young man. And I took the driving test and I failed. And it actually took me three more years and four more driving tests until I finally passed on the fifth try. So you might not want to take up an offer of a lift. And during that time, and it was a long time, I spent loads and loads of hours in driving lessons. And my dad was incredibly kind, and he would also take me driving for an hour every single weekend. And my instructor would always tell me that speed, the speed limit is a limit, not a target, and my dad was really great at making sure that I wasn't going over any speed limits. So in the hours and hours driving around Cambridge, I got really, really good at following the speed limit rules. But then, after I passed my test, I was driving down to Dorset with some friends, and I was diligently following the motorway speed limit of 70 miles per hour. And my friends were a bit surprised by this, and you know, they tapped me on the shoulder, and they asked me, do I not know that you can always get away with an extra 10% over the speed limit rule? And I faced a bit of a decision, right? Do I follow the rule that I know is right, or do I bend it slightly? Do I just do what I can get away with to get to the destination faster? And can you guess? I chose the second option. I bent the rule, and instead, I changed the rule in my head, right? I changed it so that the speed limit on the motorway was no longer 70, it was 77. And I ignored the original purpose and meaning of those rules, which was a speed that would be safe to drive at, and instead I changed the rule to suit my own aims. And that's what the Pharisees had done. They'd chosen to ignore the original meaning of those rules so that they could instead use the rules to claim that they were perfect and to also make themselves better than anyone who didn't manage to do this. They thought that the problem of sin and impurity is external. And so if they follow all the rules, that means they must be perfect. And in verse 19, Jesus is showing just the disciples just how ridiculous this is for a very quick anatomy lesson that the food just goes to the stomach. It doesn't even get close to the heart. So there's no way that eating only certain foods can be the way to become perfect. He's showing them just how silly this line of thinking is. But we can fall into the exact same trap of thinking that our problem of sin is external, thinking that if we do certain things and avoid other things, we will make ourselves good. Perhaps it's uh, praying with impressive words, maybe doing the most serving and volunteering, maybe it's reading our Bibles every day. And if we do that enough, we will become good and pure. Or perhaps we think if we just avoid certain things, if we stay away from drinking too much, if we avoid inappropriate films, then that will make us good. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of these things. It's good to follow God's instructions. But Jesus is clear that it will not make us perfect. Because Jesus goes on to show the disciples that the problem is much deeper than the external. Jesus shows us that our problem is internal. Let's continue reading verse 20. He went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. So here, Jesus explains that he wasn't talking about toilets when he was talking to the crowd. He was actually talking about our thoughts, words, and actions. And all of these come from the most serious problem we have, the problem of our hearts. And Jesus shows, that it's, 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 uh, Jesus shows us that it isn't what we eat that's the issue, 
but it's what comes out of our hearts from what is deep inside of us. Jesus is clear that the purity food laws were never actually going to solve, save anybody because it's like papering over a crack. Following the rules won't actually make somebody pure because deep down, everybody's heart is already impure. Now, excuse the English teacher in me, um, but let's just run through the vocabulary on this uh, passage to just see how impossible it is to escape being impure. But there won't be a test later, don't worry. So this, we've got a huge list of evil thoughts here. We've got sexual immorality, anything you might feel ashamed about relating to lust or sex, theft, so stealing, murder, killing, or wishing harm, adultery, going against marriage vows, whether yours or other people's, greed, wanting more than you need, Malice, being spiteful and desiring harm to others. Deceit, trying to trick people. Lewdness, being indecent or obscene. Slander, gossiping or lying. Arrogance, thinking you're better than others. Folly, dangerous, foolishness. And we might look at this list and think, well, maybe a few of these I'm not great at. Maybe I've been a bit greedy. Maybe I've been a bit envious of a colleague. And maybe I've made one or two lewd jokes with a mate at a football club. But overall, I'm doing all right. But the problem with purity is that it's all or nothing. Purity requires 100% perfection. As soon as you make something a tiny bit impure, by definition, it is no longer pure. For example, if you spill a drink on a corner of your bed sheet, you wouldn't just ignore it, right? You'd wash the whole sheet because it's no longer pure, even though it's just a little bit impure. And Jesus is giving us this long list to show just how wide and deep the problem is. And notice that these, this is also a list of thoughts. As soon as we think or feel these things, for a moment, we instantly become impure. So that means that that momentary thought of what someone looks like under their clothes is sexual immorality, or that wish that you could take credit for your colleague's idea is theft, and getting angry with your sibling and briefly wishing they weren't around is murder. And in verse 23, Jesus says that all these evils come from inside and defile a person. All of these things are so much harder to clean than our food or our hands because this is an internal problem and one that's impossible for us to change on our own. I wonder if there's some things on this list that you've struggled with on your own for years and years and it might feel like they're just never going to change. And this is a crunch point when it comes to Jesus. This is often the moment people choose either to keep or stop following Jesus because he's moved from being a powerful figure that has some interesting moral teachings to somebody who says that everyone in the world is impure, that everyone has evils inside of them. And he's even saying that about you sitting here today. And that is a message that's incredibly challenging and perhaps even hurtful, especially living in our modern multicultural Western society where everyone is encouraged to live out their own truth as long as they don't try and impose it on anyone else. So perhaps you're sitting here tonight and you feel a bit offended reading this list and offended that Jesus is saying that it applies to you. Maybe you don't like the idea of being told you're a bad person, especially by someone who lived 2,000 years ago. You might feel like you might just want to ignore this list and brush it off. And that's something that I also would be very tempted to do, to just brush my behavior and actions under the carpet. But if I was honest with you, if you saw everything that I've done in, in the last week and compared it to this list, you would see that I've demonstrated every single one of these evil thoughts. And perhaps deep down, you might feel the same same way about yourself, that maybe you aren't quite as good as you present yourself to be, that there are things that you aren't proud of, that you keep hidden. Now, if Jesus just stopped there, just came to a point about how bad and evil we are as humans, then I think we'd be a bit right to be a bit frustrated. It's a bit like when a colleague tells you that you've made a crucial, colossal mistake and then just walks away without offering any help, leaving you completely stuffed and confused, absolutely no way of fixing the problem. But if you've been with us as we've looked through Mark, you'll have seen that Jesus doesn't just identify problems, he's here to fix them. So while we can't solve our problems, Jesus has the power to solve our problems. In Mark, we've seen a range of problems. We've seen the man with leprosy in chapter 1. We've seen the paralyzed man in chapter 2, the storm in chapter 4, the demon-possessed man in chapter 5, the dead girl in chapter 5. And with each of these problems, Jesus hasn't just pointed it out and walked away. He's fixed them. He removed the leprosy. He made the paralyzed man walk. He calmed the storm. He removed the demons, and he brought the dead girl back to life. 
Jesus is clearly not somebody who just wants to point out our flaws, to punish us and make us feel bad about ourselves. Jesus doesn't want to hurt us. He wants to help and save us. And if we look back to the problem about the food laws in verse 18 and 19, Jesus didn't just point out that the Israelites were getting it wrong and then walk away. Instead, he declared in verse 18 that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them. He removed the old laws. And Mark explains this in verse 19. Notice in the brackets it says, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. So Jesus removes the old laws because they could never actually make us pure. And the fact that Mark actually pauses his narration to state this shows that it was incredibly difficult for the early church to understand, to move on from the old Israelite rules. Mark is wanting to make us really understand that Jesus came down from heaven to be revolutionary, to make a relationship with Jesus, no longer something just for Israelites, and no longer something that was impossible to maintain and achieve. Because Jesus came down to earth to find a real and permanent solution to the internal problem of our hearts, to find a way to permanently make us pure. And although it seems like he drops the topic of purity as we go on to read the next section of Mark, we've seen that Jesus is not somebody who points out a problem and doesn't fix it. Jesus hasn't just come to point out the flaws and problems of our hearts. Because really, the only reason that Jesus came down from heaven is to fix our hearts, to make us pure, so that we can have a relationship with God and eternal life in heaven. The fact that Jesus doesn't actually say anything further in this moment shows just how big a problem our hearts are. It's something that can't be solved with a quick fix. Jesus couldn't just declare our hearts clean in that moment because he knows that we would inevitably make it unclean again. The problem of our impurity needs a bigger solution. And so Jesus creates a perfect, permanent solution when he chooses to die on the cross. And in that moment, he takes all the sin and impurity of the world on his shoulders, both in the past and the future, not just temporarily, but permanently purifying anyone who believes in him. So when Jesus declares all food clean in this passage, it's giving us a little foretaste of what he's ultimately going to do on the cross. He's going to declare all people who believe in him as clean and pure. And that's something that we need to kind of remember, isn't it? So this passage reminds us that we can't become clean ourselves and that we can't just follow rules and rituals to make ourselves perfect. Instead, we have something that really purifies us. Jesus dying on the cross to take away all our sin and impurity completely and permanently. So as we go about the week ahead, let's keep reminding ourselves that we do have an internal problem, that our hearts and minds are full of evil thoughts and actions. But unlike the Israelites, we don't need to relentlessly follow rigid rules and regulations to try and earn our way into purity, to desperately try to fix our impure hearts because Jesus has permanently solved the problem of our hearts, and that's something to truly rejoice about this week. Thank you, Dominic. Well, we're going to spend time now examining our hearts and bringing to God the things and the ways in which we have not lived as we should have done this week. And we're going to do this now in the form of a confession, which hopefully will come up on the screen for us. Let's say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life. To the glory of your name, amen. May Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring his pardon and peace now and forever. Amen. Hear the words of comfort, our Saviour Christ says, 
to all who truly turn to him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We're going to sing now of this one and only Son, Jesus, now. Our next song reminds us that Jesus was sent from heaven to purchase and redeem the very ones who nailed him to a tree. And we are included in that number when we fail to truly love God with every part of our lives. So let's stand and sing, Man of Sorrows.
Father God, thank you for the cleanness that comes through the blood of Jesus that washes us clean of all of our sins, not just on the outside, but on the inside. Thank you so much that you've made us pure in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Christ is indeed our hope in life and death. Well, that brings us end to the end of our formal part of the service, but Lizzie's got some uh, drinks ready for us over there, so please go and uh, spend some time now chatting, maybe talking about some of the things we've heard this evening. And in a, about 10 minutes, I think student group will start in the hall just at the end of the corridor. Have a good week, everybody.